God is preaching time. You told me a long time ago, if I'd opened up my mouth, you'd speak for me. I'm going to open up my mouth, Lord, and I'm expecting a miracle till the soul of the mind, the heart, and the spirit so that the seed planted today can fall on good soil with proper care can grow into a fruit-bearing tree. In the words of the psalmist, I need you now. Bless this message, this moment, and even this man, not because the preacher deserves it, but because the people desire it. But pour so much oil on my head that the ground beneath my feet would be wet. Give us information for our head, illumination for our heart, and inspiration for our hand. And Lord, if you be so kind, send the preacher now. We won't even wait to the end of the sermon, but we'll give you praise in advance for your credit is all right with us. For us in the strong name of Jesus, our champion, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. 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 We are. We thank God, of course, for uh, Dr. Tucker who led us in worship. God bless you, my sister. Pre really appreciate it. Isaiah, the 40th chapter, 28th the 31st verses we'll look at it in three different translations first is, will be the new international version it says do you not know have you not heard the Lord is the everlasting God creator of the ends of the earth he will not grow weary and his understanding no one can fathom he gives strength or strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength they will soar on wings like eagles somebody say eagles they will run and not grow weary they will walk and not faint the New Living Translation says it like this have you never heard have you never understood the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure his depths of his understanding. He gives power to those who are tired and worn out. He offers strength to the weak. Even youths become exhausted. Young, me, young men will give up. But those who wait on the Lord will find new strength. They will fly high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Finally, the message translation says, don't you know anything? Haven't you been listening? God doesn't come and go. God lasts. He is the creator of all that you can see or imagine. He doesn't get tired out, doesn't pause to catch his breath. And he knows everything inside and out. He energizes those who get tired and gives fresh strength for those that drop out. For even young people tire and drop out. Young folk in their prime will stumble and fall. But those who wait on God get fresh strength. They will spread their wings and soars like eagles. They will run and don't get tired. They walk and don't lag behind. I hope we have some fun today. And I want to preach with the aid and assistance of the Holy Spirit as well as your prayers. I believe I can fly. I believe, I believe I can fly. I believe I can fly. And I would that you would flank me with your prayers when I believe I can fly. Dina, you ready? Sister Dina, are you ready? <laughs> I would that you would flank me with your prayers on I believe I can fly. It is through the award-winning pen of the writer of Virginia Hamilton that we encounter the legend of the people who could fly. This classic African-American folktale informs us that not long ago in ancient Africa, our people possessed a magic that enabled us how enabled us to fly. However, when we were brought to this American landscape as slaves, somehow, some way, and somewhere, we forgot the magic. I mean, the magic that was ours in our original locale was somehow now, for some reason, rendered null and void here in America. In fact, everyone forgot the magic, the story says, everyone except the man, his name was Toby. 
See, Toby was the seer. He was the man full of wisdom. He was the official storyteller of the people. They called him old preacher, if you will. He was the one that knew the oral history of the people. It was his job to make sure he reminded the people from whence they had come and keep them on the right track. It, I mean, it was not his job to look at where they were, but it was his job to remind them who they were. It was his job. It was not his job to do things they agreed with. It was his job to lead them to new levels of understanding and knowledge. Not his job to make them feel good, but it was his job to make them better. And again, I say it was not his job to be concerned with where they were, but it was his job to be concerned with who they were. Because you do know sometimes things get so bad that in where you are that you got to remember who you are. Things can mess you up where you are and every once in a while you have to say remember who you are because sometimes you have to remember that it is your content that will inform your context because who you are sometimes is greater than where you are. According to the story, Toby stood, against, stood amongst the people watching and I mean everyone was picking cotton but he was watching and I would like to suggest that the book implies that not only was he watching as he stood with the people but brother Maurice he was seeing he was just not looking or watching, but he was seeing. He was seeing the condition of the people who used to take flight, who are now subjugated to the whistles and whips of their oppressors. He saw the struggle. He saw their plight. He saw the men and the boys being stereotyped, typecast, set up, upset, imprisoned, enslaved, and even killed. He saw women and girls being let down, knocked up, turned out, downturned, impregnated, and abandoned. He saw communities laying in waste, saw Un and underemployment. He saw unfair wages. He saw unfair lending practices. He saw he saw he saw checking the cash places. He saw all of this thing. Then he saw the, even the church struggling. The church that used to be the center of community, a haven of rest for weary souls. The church that used to be relevant, now rendered trapped by tradition, paralyzed by protocol, and traumatized by the fear of its inability to catch 2,022 fish with 1979 bait. Toby, I believe, saw the plight of the people, saw the plight of the community, saw the plight of the church. But not only did he see them, they saw him standing amongst them. They were desperately waiting for him to do or say something, anything. For the story says that Sarah, a woman who was picking cotton after her being beaten by the overseer at the order of the master, told Toby, oh preacher, I can't take this anymore. And when he saw her pain and saw that she was about ready to give up, Dr. Tucker, he said into her ear these words, he said, Kuliba. Those words that she did not know, that what the author didn't even tell us what they meant. However, for some reason, they resonated and found remembrance in her African soul. And when he said, Kuliba, she sprouted wings and she began to fly. She rose high over the field, high over the master, high over the overseer, and even high over the other slaves. Because of his words, Sarah could fly. So it was over the next weeks, next days, the old preacher whispered these words to slaves and one by one and even in groups, they took off. They took flight. They left their oppression behind and they began to realize the greatness that they were divinely designed and cosmically created to achieve because of his words as they took off. But the master and overseer were also watching and they were also seeing, notice that, that it was at the word of Toby that the people took to, um, took flight. It was at the words that came out of his mouth that the, of the seer that freedom was achieved. It was something in the words of that old preacher that set people free. Something in his lyric and in his rhetoric that produced liberation and produced release. And when the master saw this there was simply one thing for him to do. He said, seize him. Silence the old man. Shut him up because he has the words that make people fly. And there's a little bit more that I want to tell. There's more to the story, but I'm going to take an exit ramp right here because watch this. If you get this, you get the whole sermon. I believe that it's always the goal of the oppressor to silence those that have words that make people fly. I mean, I don't speak words of liberation. Don't speak words of power to the marginalized. People don't, don't preach. Don't preach to people words that give power to the oppressed, depressed, and suppressed. Don't speak to truth that leads to the final 
finding, helping, or liberation of the lost, the last, and the least, you must be silenced. You must be discounted. Your reputation must be ruined. You must be in prison, or you must even be killed. I mean, think about it. The Marcus Garvey and his Back to Africa movement, Martin Luther King, who had a dream, Medgar Evers and his civil rights rhetoric, Mandela, who said apartheid was wrong, Malcolm X, who said by enemies necessary. One of my mentors, Dr. Jeremiah Wright, when he said the opposite of God, bless America, when now some 20 years later, we know he was right. Uh, what happened? What about the resolve of Rosa Parks, the courage of Coretta Scott King, the hang-in spirit of Harriet Tubman, the stay in power of Sojourner Truth? Moses even said, let my people go. And Jesus, in order to bring salvation to you and to me and this entire world, had to suffer, blay, and die. Those men and women have proclaimed prophetic words and they had to suffer due to their ability to speak truths that set people free because it's a powerful and dangerous thing to speak words that cause people to fly. If you don't believe me, just ask Isaiah. You remember Isaiah, don't you? Isaiah is what Dr. Bill Curtis calls the undisputed heavyweight champion of the written prophetic world. And here he is speaking to a people that are about ready to give up. During his writing career, of course, he has, he has spoken both to people under the threat of Assyrian oppression, and now they are taken captive by Babylon. And here in the 40th chapter, as we enter into this part of the book, it's called Deutero Isaiah. I'm just trying to show you I went to school somewhere. It's Deutero Isaiah, which means the second Isaiah, the voice of Isaiah. He takes another tone. In fact, historically, the Bible's uh, Isaiah is said to be split up into three parts. However, new studies are saying that it's split up into two parts. Either way, this is the second part. And as a result, he is, he is talking to the people and offering the them comfort to a people that have been in Babylonian exile. They are weary and they want to quit. But as Isaiah, who even during negativity is reminding the people of God, watch this Elder Winston, that God never relaxes and God never goes to sleep. Y'all not shouting yet. Even when his people think he's forgot about them, even when it seems like all is lost, even when you think things can't possibly get worse, even when you think God has lost you on God's GPS radar system, you are, even though you're tired, you want to quit and you want to throw in the towel, God is still watching. In fact, Isaiah encouraged the people by saying, God is always watching over God's people. And that's a good place to show right there that God is always watching over God's people even when it seems like you in the middle of night and darkness is all accomplished all about you you have to realize brother Stint you serve a God that can see you even in the dark oh y'all not shouting yet okay okay uh, let me see if I can help you see if I can help you I said we serve a God that can see you in the dark I used to have a dog his name was legend he was a bull mastiff about 200 pounds. I loved, I loved him, but I couldn't walk him during the day because so I could be scared of him and want to run. So at night, I'd go out, outside. Now, I was out night one time. I was out there with Legend, beautiful dog. We're sitting in there. We're out in the, in the, in the grass, so it's dark where I, I was. My daughter, Taylor Imani, comes out, and she's in the garage. There's a light in the garage, and she stands at the edge of the light and says, Daddy, are you out there? I said, yeah, baby, I'm right here. Can you see me? I said, I can see you, you're right there. She said, well, why can't I see you? I said, because my eyes have adjusted to the dark, which means I can see you, and even though you can't see me. She said, well, Daddy, can I come out there? I said, yeah, you can come out here. She says, yeah, but I can't see you. I said, well, follow my voice until you bump into me. Come here. Has anybody been at the edge of your light situation and say, Daddy, are you out there? How can you see me and I can't see you? The reason God can see you is because God's eyes have already adjusted. How you're in the light, God has gone uh, forward in to your dark places and is able to say to you keep coming until you bump into me is there anybody's testimony today that I've been in some dark situations where my eyes couldn't do it but I thank God that I walked by faith and not by sight and I bumped into God because I followed God's voice until I bumped into him yeah God can see me in the dark but if we're honest about ourselves, some of us can't shout on that because it's not that we, that, 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 um, that we don't want to shout. We probably need a shout. It's been a long time 
since we shouted. But we can't because when it comes, because when we try to shout, the only thing that comes out is negativity. The only thing that comes out is complaints, and it's frustrating because usually you're not this mean. But you try to shout, but it doesn't come out. Or some of us are mean every day. But for most of us, we're not mean all the time. We, it's, just, it's just mean can show up. Can I suggest it's going to mess you up? That mean people in your family, at your job, even at your church that are unpleasant and unfair to others, talk about others, don't extend grace to each other, it's not because they're flawed or evil. Watch this. It's simply because they're tired and need strength. I had to say my own amen right there. That's some preaching. <laughs> it's not that. I don't care how mean they are. If you want to see why people are mean, follow them home, right? The thing about it is the truth is that they're, they're, sometimes people are unpleasant, not because they're naturally unpleasant. People are unkind, not because they're naturally unkind. People are unfair, not because they're naturally unfair. They're not flawed. They're not evil. Some are, but most people are not. The truth of the matter is the reason it comes out like that is because they're tired and need strength. I want to suggest that the people that are mean to you and the people that are mean to me that talk about you and talk about me and you know who they are so don't blink your eyes too much because you might be sitting next to them. They, some of them are here today. They are mean. They are unpleasant. Not because they're existentially flawed. They're simply, they are fatigued and tired beyond their own rescue. Preach, man. Tired of being overlooked, tired of being looked over, tired of being overworked, tired of being unappreciated, tired of being the last one picked, tired of being the first cut, tired of being tired of health problems, tired of a rising responsibility but fewer applause, tired of everyone else getting noticed, tired of being less significant in this season than they were in last season, tired of seemingly aging out of their best days, tired of unfinished and unfulfilled aspirations, tired of unresolved hurt, tired of grief, tired of unfulfilled forgiveness, tired of the inability to embrace God's shift, tired it's easy to celebrate God's formal visitation tired or fearful that where they will, where will they fit in so they're crying out for the old tired of being fatigued, tired of being drained of their strength, tired they're ready to quit so they become Unpleasant. But here's the help. Here's the help. Because this is when we pull into the parking lot of the passage. Isaiah begins to address the people. In fact, he addresses it at the beginning with comfort ye my people. The beginning of the 40th verse. But when we get here, Isaiah begins to address the people in the text as well as any of us who've ever been tired. Just about to give up. He's picking it up in the end of the 28th verse. He says, have you not heard? Have you not understood? The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. In fact, the implication here in the 28th verse is that, don't miss this, that God is God's own source of God's abundance and God's power. <laughs> Y'all didn't get it. God is God's own source of God's abundance and God's power. Hudson, they're not shouting. God is God's own source of God's own abundance of God's power. Here it is, Elder Walls. The reason we're not shouting is because we're not used to sources. We're used to resources. In fact, in the 21st century church, that's all we shout about and care about is resources. We fall in love with the hand of God, which is a resource, and not the face of God, which is the source. So we run around talking about presence and not his presence. We want to shout over cash. We want to shout over cameras. We want to shout over cribs. We want to shout over clothes. Presence of my hand. But if you want the real presence, then seek my face. I don't know about you, but I'm maturing enough in my face, in my faith that you know what, the presence is cool, but I'd rather his presence. Let me show you why. Because if I get the resources and I don't have the source, the resources can wear out. But if I get the source, then I can always get more resources. 
I don't want resources without the source. You're still not getting it. All right, Lady G, make, hey baby, Lady G makes a good pot pie. Now, I'm not trying to say it's better than your pot pie. I don't do that. I'm just saying it's good to my taste buds. My wife's pot pie. Are you talking about pot pies the other day? <laughs> Denise, yeah, good pot pie. But I ain't never hugged the pot. I never snuggled up to the pan because if I snuggle up to the pan, the pan is going to wear out. But oh, if I snuggle up to the cook, if I whisper sweet nothings to the cook, when my pie pie run out, I can talk to the cook to get me some more pie pie. Can I help you real quick? Is there anybody in here that says, I like my house, I like my car, I like my family, but those are resources. I need to get in the face of the source and say, hey boo, I bless your name. I give you glory because when my stuff runs out, if I'm in love with the source, I can get more stuff. Yeah. God is the source of God's own abundance, of God's own power. It started with God. That doesn't say how much power God has. But the implication between verse 28 and 29 is that God has unlimited source of power because he has enough to spare. God doesn't have enough power that God has to keep it to God's self. God has enough power that God can share and still, Dorinda, have the same godness that God had before God shared. That's why, Sister Carla, we don't do testimony service like we used to do testimony service. You remember back in the day, you used to do testimony service some Friday nights or sometimes at the fish fry, you do uh, testimony service. Now, the reason we used to do testimony service is because we were a community organization back then. Back in the church, Dr. Hicks, that you grew up in, everybody knew everybody. Everybody looked out for everybody. In fact, our songs were community songs. We'll understand it better by and by. Not you. We'll understand it. Uh, we, we come this far by faith. Not you. We. we. We shall overcome. Not just you. We. But now, see, we bought into the Eurocentric uh, ideology of Descartes that says, I think, therefore, I am. And as a result, I cancel you. And when I cancel you, I sing now new songs that only talk about me. God has a blessing with my name on it. God favored me. I'm not looking out for the weeness. I'm looking for, up for the I-ness. And as a result, I can't shout on your testimony like we used to back in the day because if God blessed you, I think it's a competition with me and evidently God blessed you and God's going to run out of God so God can't give any God to me. Come here, boo. Let me help you out real quick. God is so abundant that when God blesses you, God is still on full so God can then come and bless me. God never loses any of God's godness while God is being God. I don't have to hate on you. There's enough God for God to be God in my life. Y'all have heard it a thousand times. That's why you need to shout when somebody gets blessed on your road. Don't, 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 cuff, don't mess your face up like you're sucking on lemons. No, 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 no. You need to get excited because you got two reasons to shout, McSwain. If God blessed somebody on your road, number one, he's still in the blessing business. Can't nobody shout on he's still in the blessing business. The other reason you need to go ahead and shout is because not only is he in the blessing business, but he's in the neighborhood. And since he's in the neighborhood, before long, he's going to get on your road, going to get in your seat. It's going to be your time and your turn. I'm looking for somebody that came up, came in here today to say, God, any way you bless me, I'll, I'll be satisfied. Verse 29. Verse 29. God has enough to share. <laughs> <laughs> Look, because it says he gives power or energizes those who are tired. He gives fresh strength to those who drop out. That's some good stuff. I was headed somewhere. 
If I wasn't headed somewhere, I, I would say, I would say, aren't you glad that you have a God that has some left over? A God that, that is a God of surplus. God that is God that is more than enough. Yeah, God that's more than enough. In fact, I had an old, old pastor whose name was Charlie Butler. He was my dad's associate. Charlie was an old, he was, he was, he was an old guy. He was from some day, somewhere down in Louisiana. And he had this thing. Anybody from Louisiana? Nobody from Louisiana. He had this thing called Land Yap. Anybody heard of Land Yap? He would shout himself on Land Yap. It was funny. He would shout. I'm talking about he, would, he was a high yellow cat. cat. He, would go, he would shout himself to the beat red off Land Yap. I'm, I'm about to learn you something. Watch this. That's what they say in the sound. Watch this. I'm going to learn you something. He said, they said that he would take, they, they, would, they would be sharecropping. And they would, they would take the stuff to the, to the store to be counted, right? And it would be counted. The man would pay. But if they were in good relationship, if they were in good relationship, not only would he pay, but he would give them extra. And the extra was called land yap. And he says, oh, for me, land yap is grace. He says, and when I think about God and how God gives me, I mean, this man would seriously shout himself into a frenzy talking about the grace of God when God gave a little land yap. But we come in so deep nowadays, we expect God to do what God has done, and we expect, in fact, we come to church, and we want it all prepared for us like we like we are the guest of honor. Do you realize you are not the guest of honor? God is the guest of honor, and we need to give God praise simply because God gave us enough land yap in order to be here today. Yeah. Yeah. So God, that's... <laughs> More than enough. Think about, think about in your life what would have been enough. Oh, take a moment. Think about what would have been enough. It would have been enough for him to wake you up this morning. But he woke you up and clothed you in your right mind. It, 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 it would have been enough. For you have rags to cover yourself with. But you got Dennis to go to your closet and pick what you want. That's called more than enough. It would have been enough for him to give you a family. But he gave you a family that loves you and wants to see you and wants to hug on you. It would have been enough for you to be, for you to know where you were. But, he, but you got a right mind and ain't lost your mind. What would have been enough? And then you think about what God has done. Don't praise him for what would have been enough. But sometimes we need to praise God for the land yet and for the extra that God gave us. All right. All right. All right. Then verse 30. Verse 30 says, Even the youth will grow weary, faint, young men will be exhausted, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles, run not get weary, walk and not faint. Those that wait, those who hope, those who have expectation, those who are in need, those who are in want, those who are in trust, those who cast their cares on God, those who are constant and consistent communication with me, God says, those who are anxious for nothing but in everything through prayer and supplication make their requests known to God. These are the ones, watch this, that will renew their strength and mount up on wings as eagles. Now, this whole renewing of strength and mounting up of eagles' wings this movement or this renewing of strength and mounting up on wings, the whole movement in the text, for those of, my, my, those of you that are my English people, verbs are action words, right? So, the, so in the text, there are movements that lead to stuff even in the Hebrew or Hebrew uh, language. So now when we talk about uh, renewing of strength, we talk about mounting up on wings, it's pointing to what? The eagle. This is all connected in the movement of the text. The movement is connected to the eagle. Y'all not getting it. The movement. So what messed me up, Minister Anita, and this is where we have a little fun, messed me up because in my sanctified imagination, I had to text Isaiah and say, why eagles? He said, well, preacher, I've been in church a long time, and I realized the church full of birds. Huh. 
I said, what do you mean? He said, I've seen a lot of birds in church, but I don't know if I've seen a lot of eagles in church because eagles are hard to find. I said, Isaiah, I'm missing it. He said, no preacher or prophetic or prophet person can ever talk directly about people, but you can talk about birds. And sometimes there's a message in the birds. I said, wow. You know, the reason I said wow is because this is the impetus of the brilliant, uh, brilliant artist that I ran into the other day at the Smithsonian Museum of African American History as I encountered the amazing work of Rashawn Rucker. He's best known for his psychological redefining art series. In this series, this will mess you up. In this series, he merges the identity of black men with the images of, of pigeons. Rock pigeons. He uses rock pigeons because, watch this, pigeons are generally perceived as urban, unclean, and unwanted. Rucker argues this is how black men are seen in America, as urban, as unclean, and as <clears throat> unwanted. Oft time pigeonholing them into spaces that they don't belong, preached Gino. Finally, Rucker said, I created these images to communicate why we as black men often don't fly. Even though we have the ability to go far above and beyond our circumstances, sometimes we don't fly because we've been pigeonholed as unwanted, as un <laughs> unwelcome, and as unclean. Sometimes there's a message in the birds. I asked Isaiah, yo, B, what's going on? Why you use an eagle? He said, because there's a lot of birds in the church, but eagles are hard to find. I'm looking for some eagles, God says, because I believe God wants us to fly. I believe I can fly like eagles. I said, well, well break it down a little bit more because I got to talk to the disciples of Mount Olivet. He said, well, I couldn't say mount up on wings as parrots. I said, help me out. He said, parrots are a beautiful bird, but they spend time doing a lot of talking, but they're not talking their own words. They're repeating other words that they heard through somebody else. They don't have a personal testimony. They don't have a personal opinion. All they're doing is repeating words that they heard somebody else say. You can't ask a parrot how they feel about something because a parrot is going to tell you what the person next to them said about what they feel about it. a parrot. I can't say, mount up on wings as parrot. Whoa, I hear you. He said, I couldn't say he mounted up on wings as peacocks. No. I said, man, you ain't seen a peacock. He said, I have seen a peacock. A peacock is also beautiful, but a peacock is too busy strutting and, and trying to be seen and always trying to be the center of attention and always trying to, to flaunt their feathers and not having time to look at somebody else's feathers. Oh, I can't say peacock. I said, well, what about the hawk? And the hawk is a bad bird. Hawk is a bad bird. He said, yeah, hawk, hawk has keen eyes. I said, I mean, that, got, they got me, that means they got good vision. He said, no, no, not necessarily, because hawks use their vision to find the flaw in somebody else. The hawk is the one that's always trying to prey on somebody else's flaws. The hawk is the one that's going to talk about every mistake the choir makes, every time the preacher does something wrong. The hawk is the proofreader of the bulletin that's going to be mad that they name ain't in the I can't say hawks. I said I can't say crow. I said I like the crow. That's a black bird. I like black. <laughs> I said no, I can't say crow. I said because a crow is a thief. Crow don't doesn't never produces anything on their own. They they go in and 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 steal from others. The crow the crow come the crow likes to enjoy what others have done. They, this is the people that doesn't want want to work on the committee but want to take the picture at the end. This 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 is the crow. The crow just snatches stuff. The crow look at somebody say you know any birds any birds. I 
I said, Isaiah, why? Why the eagle? So I couldn't say the vulture. Couldn't say the vulture. The vulture enjoys blood. I couldn't say the vulture. The vulture chooses dead things over living things. I couldn't say the vulture. The vulture feeds off stuff that should have been dead a long time ago. The vulture. The vulture lives off stuff that other people let die. The vulture. I said, I think I got you, man. Bless you, chap. I think I got you, man. I think I got you, Isaiah. What about the swan? What about the swan? Huh? Got you, dog. The swan. What about it? Isaiah said, beautiful bird. Nice try, G. They're beautiful, but they're flighty. Never stay long time. Always looking for a new pond to see their own reflection. Swan, swan is the one that all of a sudden say, I ain't being fed no more. That's the swan. And they go somewhere and see their own reflection. This is the swan. I said, okay. I said, you got me, man. Then tell me why eagle. He said, I put the eagle for two, two reasons. And, and I'm on my way out. I promise I'm done. I picked the evil, evil, eagle for two reasons. Number one is that the eagle knows how to renew its own strength. Y'all not getting it. Y'all not getting it. The eagle knows how to renew its own strength. Can I help you? See, when eagles get old and they get tired they, and they, their feathers get ruffled, after a while, the eagle goes through what is called a molting process. The molting process is when their, e their wings begin to shed and they begin to be replaced with stronger and newer and fuller and fuller wings. The e they, their wings are renewing the eagle's strength. Watch this. And the crazy thing about it, some of us are eagles and we're going through a molting process, right? And the problem about molting, don't shout yet, the problem with molting is this, is that it's an ugly process because you got some of the old left and you got some of the new coming and you look ugly. It's like when you're trying to grow natural hair, ladies, and you want to cover it up because it's that new growth doesn't look too good. You know what the picture looks like. You know what you want to look like, but you ain't there yet. And you get frustrated because I got a little ugliness on the wings, but the other wings are growing. But if you keep going through a molting process, you'll be able to renew your strength. One time word for Mount Olivet, whether you shout or not today, is we're going through a molting process. It's uncomfortable sometimes. It looks ugly sometimes. You got some old stuff that won't fall off and some new stuff that ain't strong enough yet, but it's still a molting process. But if you keep going, newer wings, I feel like it, I felt that, newer wings and stronger wings and fuller wings will grow. Next part, I'm done. Next part is I chose, Isaiah said, eagles is because eagles mount up. <laughs> They, 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 I wish I was about five inches taller. They, they mount, they mount up. I didn't know what that meant. Hey, look it up. Jonathan, I looked it up. Look it up. Said <laughs> that eagles, Diane, have the uncanny ability to sense storms before storms become storms. <laughs> Y'all not shout. They, they have the uncanny ability to sense a storm before the storm decides. Sister Grant, it wants to become a storm. 
And most birds, shoemate doesn't shout you, most birds, when they know it's going to be a storm, they go for cover and they hide from the impending storm. Gene, I see you. You got it already. Not an eagle. An eagle, Tracy, flies toward the storm. And when the eagle gets close to the storm, watch it, the eagle turns around, hikes up its wings. And when it hikes up its wings, the wind of the storm can get under the, wi the wings of the eagle and push the eagle above the storm. And I'm looking for about 15 people that can say, you know what? You just bless me. I'm not going to be no chicken. I'm not going to be no crow. I'm not going to be no peacock. But today, I'm going to become an eagle because I'm going to the next level. I'm flying to my storm and I'm giving God the credit. Is there anybody here? that can go ahead and bless God and say, I believe I can fly. I believe I can fly. Now, now, all of it, I'm simply standing here today to simply say to you prophetically, it's time to fly. Kuliba. <laughs> it's time to fly. It's time to fly. I know we're going through multi. I know we get tired. I know we get frustrated. I know there's some new stuff. I know it's growing pains. All of that stuff. But Kuliba, it's time to fly. I know you're tired. Let God renew your strength. It's time to fly. Don't, don't, don't get frustrated. Because if you get frustrated, you get chatty. And when you get chatty, you're going to talk somebody else who's ready to fly out of flying. If you want to be on the ground, stay on the ground. Just as long as you're ready to, when you're ready to go, I'm going to tell you these words. I believe that you can fly. I believe you can fly. I dare you to look at somebody and say, I believe you can fly. I believe you can fly. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. And I believe this church can fly. He gives power to the faint and to those who grow weary. But they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and not faint. This, beloved, is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to our God. Standing all over the building if you can. If you can, if you're able, stand all over the building. Look at your neighbor and say, which bird are you? <laughs> Doors of the church are open. I'm, sim I'm simply here to tell you this. I don't care what bird you are. We, we got all of them in here. You need to be in here with us. If you do not have a church home, this is your time. This is your day. Won't you come? Make this your time. Make this your place. I'd love to be your pastor. We'd love to be your family. Won't you come? By letter, by Christian experience as a candidate for baptism. No longer bound. No more chains. No more chains holding me. My soul is resting. It's just a blessing. It's just a blessing. Y'all sing it for me. My voice can't do it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Hallelujah. I'm free. I am free, yeah. Longer bound. No longer bound. Come on, put your hands together for. No more you can do better than that. Come on, bless God. My soul is resting. It's 
just a blessing. It's just a blessing. Oh, praise the Lord. Let's do it one more time. I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. I am free. Praise the Lord, I'm free. No longer bound. No longer bound. No more chains. No more chains holding me. My soul. It's just a blessing. It's just a blessing. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You may be seated. You may be seated. You may be seated. We're gonna get we're gonna get the name of this young man and we're going to introduce him at the end, but we're tra we're trans We're moving toward the table. We're transitioning toward the table. What, I wonder what kind of bird Jesus was. Ready to quit in the garden. But somehow saying, not my will, but thine be done. Renewing strength enough to die on the cross for you and for me. And as the old preacher say, he did die. Oh, yes, he did. But Sunday morning, the first day of the week, God, by God's power, raised him from the dead. And we're here to celebrate. I taught of this in Bible study on Tuesday. I told the people, I told the people of Dr. John Fine, Paul Feinberg, who was my teacher, my master's degree. He shared with us the power of the table. He says, it's the genius of our Lord that he would use something as common as eating and drinking for us to remember the greatest sacrifice of all time. No matter how rich you are, how poor you are, you have to eat and drink. No matter what language or hue of skin, eating and drinking. Feinberg says, every table on earth fits as a jigsaw puzzle to another table. So the people in the Pacific that celebrated it this morning, the people on the other side of the world that will celebrate it this tonight, and even the table at Mount Olivet, all fits as patches of a quilt to come together as one family, one family that celebrates this gift together aren't you glad you got an invitation to the table what does the cross of Jesus mean it's more than the songs we sing much more than that emblem on your chain, but it means I am free from the chains of slavery, and the blood that shed won't let my sins remain. Upon the cross, my Savior died. The Lamb was crucified. 
showed us love that this world may never know. Oh, what love so divine. True love you never find. So that we might live, love came and died alone. If you do not know that song, go back and get it. That's Donnie McClurkin. It's one of my favorite songs ever. So simple. Tells what God did for us through Jesus Christ on the cross. We are admonished not to come to this table unworthy. Admonished that we would confess our sins before our God and before each other so that we do not cause, the Bible says in the King James, damnation unto our souls. One of the things we like to do is say it wasn't us, it was us, we did it. But it's okay because the blood cleanses it. So we need to confess. We have a litany that we read and recite each, each first Sunday as we celebrate. So let's recite the litany together. Eternal and merciful God, we humbly confess before you and each other that we have been unfaithful to you. We lack love for our neighbors. We waste opportunities to do good. We look the other way when you cry out to us in the sufferings of our brothers and sisters in need. We are sincerely sorry for our sins, both those we commit deliberately and those that we allow to overtake us. We ask for your forgiveness and pray for strength that we might follow in your way and love all your people with the perfect love that casts out all fear. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, amen and amen. I say it all the time. I've been here a year and a half now, so you know what I'm about to say next. If you're like me, all your stuff wasn't up there. As a result, let's take a moment of silence that we might be able to confess our sins to our maker. And God, for things we said or things we didn't say, for things we did or we didn't do, for people we were with or, sh or were not with, we bring all of those to you. For our, for our very thought life. Not the stuff we said, but the stuff we almost said. The stuff we shouldn't have thought about, but we did. We bring it to you. And as we bring it to you, God, we ask that you would cover it with the blood of Christ. Give us grace that we might do better. In fact, use your mercy for what we've already done and use your grace to help us do better. And we believe that because we brought them to you, you are faithful and you are just to forgive us for our sins. So we ask forgiveness in Jesus' name. Bless this bread. Represents your body. Bless this cup. Represents your blood. And we will give you glory in Christ's name. Amen. Paul tells us on the night that Jesus was to be betrayed, that he took bread and he broke it. Just for me. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. The inference is mine is broken, so yours does not have to be broken. And as often as you eat of it, do it in remembrance of me. Let us all eat together. Likewise, he took a cup. The Bible says, and gave thanks for it also. He said, this is my blood which is shed for you, shed for you in the remission of sins. The inference is, mine is shed, so yours does not have to be. He said, we shall not drink again until we drink with my Father in heaven. As often as you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. We know that the world drinks to forget. 
Today we drink that we might remember. Let us drink together. The Bible says that they sang a hymn and went to Mount Olivet. Let us in Mount Olivet <laughs> say the prayer that the Lord left us to be on one accord. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Share a sign of peace with your neighbor, sign of peace with your neighbor. Let us won't you come come introduce. Bless you, man. Bless you, son. God bless you, darling. Mount Olivet, the ministries of Deacons has found Osborne Brown coming on restoration. Come on, bless God for Brother Osborne Brown. As we're standing all over the building, I love you. There's nothing you can do about it. Thank you for allowing me to be your pastor. Thank you for allowing me to be me as crazy as that can be sometimes. Thank you for loving my beautiful wife and our entire family. Now, beloved of God, look here and receive the benediction. I speak life to you. Pray no bad thing would come nigh thee. Pray that God would bless your going ins and your coming outs. That God would give you peace in your labor and in your leisure. That God would order your steps and your stops. That by his grace he will provide for you. By his mercy he will prevent from you. That because God loves you he'll say yes to you. And simply because God loves you. Sometimes God will say no to you. That no matter which bird you be today. That God will elevate you. Renew your strength. And allow you to mount up on wings as eagles. Until we meet again, go in peace. And may the peace of God go with you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Come on, let's sing this together before we leave. Praise God. All blessings. below. you. God bless you. We ask that you still continue to follow the ushers and also don't congregate.